Ah, welcome, my pretty, the beautiful witch said, her eyes twinkling like stars in a midnight sky. So you're interested in the Salem witches? Well, you've certainly come to the right person. Grab onto the hem of my cloak. We're about to embark on a journey through the veils of time. With a wave of her gnarled wand and a mumbled incantation, the world around you started to blur. Colors swirled into a kaleidoscope of images, and you felt a pull as though being yanked backward through a tunnel of light. When the dizzying sensations ceased, you found yourself standing in the year 1692, surrounded by the sights and sounds of Salem Village. In early 1692, the once peaceful Salem Village in the Massachusetts Bay Colony became the epicenter of a hysteria that would forever mark its history. It all began with a group of young girls displaying bizarre behaviors, and these initial accusations acted as kindling, setting the entire region ablaze with fear and suspicion of witchcraft. Elizabeth Paris, the nine-year-old daughter of Reverend Samuel Paris, and her cousin, Abigail Williams, began to exhibit strange behaviors. They screamed, contorted their bodies in unnatural poses, threw things, and claimed they felt pinches and pricks. Their alarming symptoms soon spread to other girls in the village, including Anne Putnam Jr. and Mercy Lewis. These unexplained afflictions baffled local doctors, with Dr. William Griggs suggesting that the girls were under the influence of an evil hand or witchcraft. In a society deeply rooted in the Puritan belief system, such a diagnosis found immediate resonance. The distressed community, desperate for answers, urged the afflicted girls to identify those responsible for their torments. Under duress and amidst the community's growing anxiety, the girls named three women, Sarah Good, known to Salem as a destitute beggar. She was known to mumble and mutter, which some took as curses. Sarah Osborne. Unlike Good, Osborne was not impoverished, but she had her own set of controversies, notably a scandalous relationship with an indentured servant. And Tichuba, an enslaved Indian woman of Caribbean descent owned by Reverend Paris. Tichuba's involvement in the Salem witch trials is particularly noted for her confession to practicing witchcraft, as well as her vivid and detailed descriptions of her encounters with malevolent entities. When pressured during her examination, Tichuba not only admitted her alleged involvement in witchcraft, but also implicated others. She claimed that Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, two other women who were accused early on, were involved with her in the witchcraft activities. She spoke of seeing mysterious animals, of riding on sticks to witch meetings, and of a mysterious tall man who tempted her to sign the Devil's Book. Her tales were filled with descriptions of spectral visions, including seeing other witches whom she could not or did not specifically name. These vivid descriptions and apparent knowledge of witchcraft served to fan the flames of hysteria in Salem. It not only validated the girls' claims, but also heightened the community's paranoia. It was Tichuba's testimony that introduced the possibility of a large conspiracy of witches operating in Salem. And so the hunt was on. These initial accusations opened the floodgates. With the validation of Tichuba's confession and the weight of the girls' continuous afflictions, neighbors began to turn on neighbors, old grudges resurfaced, and soon, accusations of witchcraft spread like wildfire throughout the region. As accusations of witchcraft multiplied in the spring of 1692, the colony's leadership established a special court, known as the Court of Oye and Terminer, to handle the burgeoning caseload. This court was tasked with examining and determining the fates of those accused of witchcraft. Presided over by Chief Justice William Stoughton, a staunch believer in the reality of the witchcraft threat, the trials were anything but fair by today's standards. One of the most contentious aspects of these proceedings was the admissibility of spectral evidence, testimony in which the afflicted claimed to see the specter or ghostly presence of an accused person committing malevolent acts. This form of evidence, inherently subjective and non-verifiable, 
played a pivotal role in many convictions. Other forms of specious evidence admitted into court was the touch test. It was believed that victims of witchcraft would have a specific reaction when touched by their witch. In some cases, an accused witch would be brought into court and asked to touch a victim. If the victim reacted, usually by coming out of a fit, it was seen as proof that the accused had bewitched them. And witches' marks, or devil's marks. Any unusual mark or blemish on the accused's body could be seen as a place where the devil had marked them or where they suckled familiar spirits. Such marks could include moles, scars, or birthmarks. Sometimes witch prickers were used to probe these marks. It was believed that true witches' marks would be insensitive to pain and would not bleed. As the number of accused grew, so did the challenges of detaining them. Local jails, like the one in Salem Town, quickly became overcrowded. The prison conditions in 17th century Massachusetts were appalling. Prisons were dark, damp, and overcrowded, with minimal sanitation. Inmates, regardless of age or gender, were shackled with heavy iron chains, and their movement was extremely limited. The accused were forced to use buckets or the floor for defecation and urination. With little ventilation and inadequate nutrition, diseases spread rapidly. For those with underlying health conditions, or for the very young or old, these environments could be, and often were, deadly. It's in such conditions that several accused witches, awaiting trial or execution, met their premature end. Giles Corey, a well-off farmer from Salem Village, and his wife, Martha Corey, both were accused of witchcraft. As a respected member of the community and a regular churchgoer, her accusation sent shockwaves through Salem. If someone as pious as Martha could be accused, truly anyone could fall under suspicion. When Giles was heard criticizing the trials, he soon found himself accused of witchcraft. As a means of protesting the legitimacy of the proceedings and the reliance on spectral evidence, he simply refused to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. By so doing, he was calling into question the legitimacy of the whole affair. He simply was not going to participate in the madness. According to English common law, a trial could not proceed unless the accused entered a plea of guilty or not guilty. If an individual did not enter a plea, then a formal trial could not take place. The court resorted to pressing in an attempt to extract a plea. Pressing was a form of torture and execution wherein the victim was stripped naked with a heavy board laid on their body. Then, heavy stones were placed on the board, gradually increasing the weight. This method was used to coerce individuals into pleading guilty or not guilty to charges, but in the case of Giles Corey, it became a means of execution. Corey, steadfast in his refusal to legitimize the court's proceedings, chose not to enter a plea. Over two days, heavier and heavier stones were placed upon him until the weight fatally crushed him. His last reported words were a defiant request for more weight. Of the more than 200 accused, 30 were convicted of witchcraft and sentenced to death by hanging. 19 were ultimately executed. Several others who were convicted died in jail before their execution could take place. However, by fall 1692, doubts began to overshadow the court's convictions. Prominent voices like Increase Mather, minister and president of Harvard College, condemned the reliance on spectral evidence. The shift in public sentiment was palpable. Many began to question the legitimacy of the proceedings, especially as accusations reached even the colony's elite. The decisive turning point came in October 1692, when Governor William Phipps, influenced by both personal and public concerns, including his own wife being questioned for witchcraft, dissolved the Court of Oyer and Terminer. In its stead, he established the Superior Court of Judicature, which explicitly forbid the use of spectral evidence. This change led to a significant reduction in convictions. The new court released many of those awaiting trial and pardoned those awaiting execution. By May 1693, Phipps released all the remaining prisoners, 
effectively putting an end to the witch trials. Welcome back, time travelers. Having experienced the Salem witch trials firsthand, you now possess a unique understanding of that tumultuous era. Let's reflect on the complex forces that shaped this event and discuss its profound implications for today. Share your insights and observations below or as assigned by your professor. Please take a moment to address the following thought questions. Describe the Puritan worldview and the 17th century belief in witches. Describe Tachuba's role and significance to the Salem witch hysteria. Why did it happen? Identify and discuss the various theories that seek to analyze why it happened. Sadly, witch hunts have not gone away. Compare and contrast the Salem witch hysteria to the daycare sex abuse hysteria during the 1980s and 1990s.